Today I'm going to show you how the multi-link suspension system works on your car. Now the purpose of any automotive suspension system is to number one, support the weight of the vehicle, number two, provide any comfort for its right occupants, and number three, maintain good control of the wheel relative to its chassis so that it remains planted on the road at all times. Here's a shot of the front multi-link suspension in action. You can see as we take a turn here how the double ball joint action works on the lower control arms. And here's a pretty unclear shot of the rear suspension as we go over bumps. So here we have a look at the multi-link rear suspension on this vehicle. So I'm going to drop down the rear subframe and suspension assembly so we can have a closer look at how everything works together. And then I can remove the shock. Now I'm going to remove the front subframe bolt. And then remove this bracket here. And with all the nuts free, I'm going to lower the subframe down onto the ground. This bushing is stuck in its sleeve. All right, the rear subframe bushing is on fire. I'm gonna have to call in the big guns. I just ended up chopping the subframe. So here we've got a good shot of the two ball joints on the suspension here. This one goes to the compression rod, which goes towards the back. And then we have the cross link over here that has the shock attached to it, as well as the stabilizer link. Now the compression link actually mounts to the body at the back there, while the cross link over here mounts to the subframe. And now with this brace off, I'm gonna drop down this control arm. And here we have the entire front and rear multi-link suspension removed from the vehicle so we can have a closer look at how it works. So we got the front here, we have the front spindle assembly with three control arms attached to it. We have a strut and a sway bar that goes over to the other side. And at the back here we have the rear aluminum subframe that houses the differential and the CV axles for this rear wheel drive vehicle. We've also got four control arms on either side as well as the separate shock absorber and a coil. Now looking at the typical five link setup here, if this is the top view in the front of the vehicle, we have the trailing arm and the leading arm and that positions the wheel longitudinally. We've also got the toe link here which controls the angle of the toe of this tire. On the front view here we have the upper and lower control arm and that will control the camber angle of the tire. From the side view here you can see that all these links are oriented in different planes and that's there to resist torsional forces from acceleration or braking. Now this being a rear wheel we want to constrain all the other degrees of freedom except the up and down direction to absorb bumps. So to do that we have a five link design in this case here and it's either got a ball joint on the end like this one or a bushing on the end. Now most multi-link suspensions can be modeled as either a three, four, or a five-link setup. Now a three-link setup has only three degrees of freedom. It can move laterally, up and down, and steer about its steering axis. A four-link setup can move up and down and steer about its axis. It's got two degrees of freedom, which is good for the front wheels of a vehicle. And for the rear wheel of a vehicle, you only need one degree of freedom, which is where you'd use the five-link setup to move up and down. So if this direction is the front of the vehicle, we're gonna start here with this trailing arm link, and it basically links the frame of the vehicle to the wheel carrier, and it's positioned almost in the forward-facing direction. Now, as a trailing link, it's responsible for resisting any braking or acceleration forces of this wheel carrier assembly. Next up, we have this lateral link instead of here, and it's oriented in a transverse manner. It ties the frame to the wheel carrier at the bottom here and controls the toe angle, which is the angle between the straight forward direction and this wheel here. Now, towing in the front wheels will allow the vehicle to track straight. However, if you tow out the rear wheels, that can cause instability. Now, on a front wheel drive vehicle, you want tow out because the front wheels have so much torque that they actually produce a moment allowing them to tow in during heavy acceleration. You can see that this oblong bolt head here actually allows you to adjust the factory tow on this link. Now at the top here we have the rear upper control arm and this basically functions as two links but in one piece. On this side here where it attaches to the knuckle we have a ball joint which gives it that extra degree of freedom and over here at the subframe we have two bushings. We've also got a connection to the stabilizer link over here which goes over to the sway bar to the other side. Now the upper control arm controls the camber angle which is the angle of the wheel relative to the vertical plane. Now looking from the rear of the vehicle, camber is negative when the bottom part of the tire is sticking out and positive when the top part of the tire is sticking out. Now camber is good for cornering because when the body itself rolls, the full contact of this tire will make contact with the ground and give you maximum grip around that corner. This is usually achieved using a short long arm suspension where the upper control arm is shorter than the lower control arm and that geometry allows the camber to gain in the negative direction when the suspension is pushed up and then in the positive direction when the suspension is pushed down 
which is really good for the contact patch and corner. Now at the back here we have the shock absorber which goes up into the wheelhouse. We've also got this coil spring here which sits in the vehicle frame at the top and at the bottom it sits inside of this bedpan rear lower control arm. Now this control arm is actually a load bearing control arm which means that any of the forces that come through the wheel and the vehicle's weight itself is actually supported through this control arm before it goes up into the spring and supports the body. Now the sway bar is this beam that I've colored in red here that goes from one side to the other side secured to the subframe here by two bushings. When there's relative moment between the two the bar acts like a torsion beam and it twists and it basically tries to counter the force of cornering to bring the left side wheel and the right side wheel in the same plane. Now to demonstrate how the sway bar works if I pick up this wheel over here you can see over there as that wheel starts to pick up and then if I push down on it you can also see that that wheel starts to push down trying to maintain that flat plane between two wheels. Now having a sway bar that goes from side to side doesn't necessarily classify this as a dependent suspension because the two wheels move to each other. The torsion resistance of this is so small it only works a little bit in corner. If I disconnect it here you can really see the dependent nature of this wheel while that wheel doesn't really move. And here we come to the advantages of the multi-link design starting with of course its compactness. It doesn't take up too much room in the vehicle itself. We've also got an easy modability so for example if you're a tuner and you wanted to change an angle such as a camber or a caster angle you only got to change one link and it just changes one parameter. You also got really good suspension articulation especially for off-road purposes and it also handles pretty good because it maintains really good contact with the road which is why you'll find it in more premium vehicles. Of course there are some disadvantages mostly due to its complexity. There's a lot of different wear points here so come service time this could be pretty expensive to repair. It's also pretty expensive overall to build because you've got a lot of different linkages in the system. So all that being said we're going to start taking things apart so we can have a closer look at what's inside. Now the CV axle is actually bolted up to the hub here. Next up is the front lower. Now one of the reasons why these control arms are hard to remove is because the bushing is under tension here and they're normally torqued at the suspension when it's level. Now when you're trying to force it against itself, it's just going to twist the inner rubber inside of here and break. That's why it's very important to torque these bushings when the vehicle is at ride height so it doesn't overstress it. Now I'm going to remove the rear upper control arm. Let's move off this boot here. I'm just going to use a fresh pair of my brother's underwear I stole here and wipe this off. Right, I got some vice grips on there. See if I can blast off this nut. If all else fails, it's time to call in the big guns. There we go. I'm just going to remove this trailing arm here. Seems like a lot of these suspension fasteners are stuck solid to the inner sleeve of the bushing. And I'm going to remove these four bolts that hold the hub on. And you can hear how stiff and grindy this is. Now wheel bearings also have a play in the suspension system. It basically mounts the wheel carrier to the wheel and brake assembly itself. And it also determines the distance from which the wheel is offset from the suspension. Now the bushing for this link no longer holds its position, which means that this bushing is really worn out. It should have some spring back like this one. So here we have the entire suspension disassembled from this corner of the vehicle. Now if we observe the construction of most of these components here, with the exception of the lateral link and this trailing arm here, most of it is made of aluminum. We have the upper control arm that is a forged aluminum piece here and we have this bedpan control arm and the knuckle itself that is a cast aluminum piece and this is really done to save weight because anything that sits below the spring here and is suspended by the suspension itself is called unsprung weight and too much unsprung weight could have detrimental effects on the vehicle's handling. So if you look at a free body diagram of the vehicle we have the car's weight here which is supported by its spring damper then we have the unsprung mass which is basically the weight of the brakes, the tires and the suspension and then that is supported on the ground by the tires. Now the tires themselves has a little bit of a springiness effect to it so we represent that here with a spring damper system. Now when a damper in the system wears out the only damping left in the whole system is done by the tires and that's why you have tire cupping. Now this here is the rear knuckle and it serves for the mounting points for many things that attach to the wheel assembly. Now looking at the subframe to where all five of these suspension links actually mount to, you can see everything has to work around this rear axle assembly here where the differential drives the rear wheels. Now the stabilizer link is a very high wear item on most suspensions. Now on the end of each link we have these bushings here which are integrated into the link itself. So here we have the bushing cut apart here. And if I remove the bushing here, you can see that it actually has a metal outer sleeve that was pressed into this control arm over here just like this. 
And then we have a metal inner sleeve on the inside here. And you can see this bushing doesn't really have too much rubber material on the inside there. It's actually pretty thin. And that's just because it's more of a handling bushing than a ride bushing that has to absorb road shock. And it only has to resist the torsion of this arm moving up and down. Now in comparison, this bushing on the subframe here is actually pretty soft. You can see I can move it with my brother's toothbrush here. And that's just because it not only has to locate the subframe on the vehicle, but it has to absorb any vibrations or any road shock that comes through the subframe and into the body. Now you can see the tubular structure of how this aluminum subframe is made. It's basically a bunch of tubes that's welded together with these braces. So here we have the entire front suspension laid out here. Now the transverse link is a loaded control arm because it attaches the coilover strut to the body and carries the weight of the vehicle. It also ties into the cross member which attaches to the other side and holds the engine cradle. Over here it connects to the wheel carrier at a ball joint. The wheel carrier itself also has another compression rod that comes off the back here with a secondary ball joint. Then up at top here we have an upper ball joint. Now the steering knuckle has one more attachment point here for the tie rod end. Now you might be wondering, well how does this double ball joint action work? Because it's not as simple as having a single pivot point at the top here to turn the steering knuckle. Now the steering axis is basically the line that goes to the upper and lower control arms where they attach at the wheel assembly. Now we also have the axis of the tire here and the offset between them is called the scrub radius. Now from the top view here if we have the steering axis over here and the center of the line this distance here actually allows the force which is created from the tire either during acceleration or braking to create a moment and cause either a toe out or a toe in situation either pulling when braking or torque steer when accelerating. Now to alleviate this we can move the steering axis closer to the center of the tire itself. Now one way to do this is to use a double ball joint on either the lower or the upper control arms and that creates a virtual pivot point where these two lines intersect to which the steering axis will pass through. If you take a line from this bushing here through this ball joint and you intersect it with the line from this bushing through this ball joint it forms an imaginary point somewhere in the middle here and that is your actual pivot point. So essentially the two links here act in compression and in tension when you turn your steering wheel. Now the main advantage of a double lower arm design is that you can change the angle of the steering inclination axis to be closer to the tire center line. And by using a short long arm control arm setup here, you can incline the axis such that its intersection with the tire patch at the bottom here is on the opposite side of the center of the tire. And what that does, if you look from the top here, is it creates a moment about the center of the tire here during heavy acceleration causing a toe-in condition which is more stable and no torque steer. Now the caster angle is basically the angle of the steering axis in the plane view of the tire itself and what that does is it allows the steering axis point to be ahead of the tire contact patch if this is the front of the vehicle. So looking from the top here if the tire is taking a turn this steering axis is going to be ahead of the contact patch which gives it a distance and the force created by the contact patch will create a moment about the steering axis allowing the steering wheel to self-center when you release the steering wheel. Now of course there are some disadvantages and the biggest one here is going to be a higher maintenance cost because these ball joints here are going to wear out a little bit faster because they are in tension and compression as well as swinging up and down for the suspension travel. This ball joint here is a loaded ball joint and it's going to be subjected to all of the suspension loads because the shock mounts here and takes the weight of the corner of this vehicle. And that's one of the main problems with the first gen G35 that this ball joint here wears out really quickly. You can actually hear it rattle around when I'm driving. And this is your rust shield. It's this wheel bearing is done. Now these two features here don't look like much, but it's actually the steering stop. Now most ball joints come with this rubber boot here to protect the ball socket from any external elements. You can see I've got the transverse link here, which has a cone shape on the inside here. And that's to accept this steel cone on the inside here. And that's just because aluminum is pretty soft. Compression nuts actually stripped out, so we're going to have to call in the big guns. Smoking hot nut. So here's the compression rod removed from the knuckle. You can see it's got the cone that is actually stuck to it. Okay, I'm gonna cut open this ball joint to see what's wrong. See how dried up the grease is? You can definitely tell this boot has not been doing a good job at protecting the internals. And you can see just how gummed up this ball is. Let's use my brother's underwear again to clean this up. And if you look closely at the ball, you can see that it's actually rusted out. And that indicates the presence of moisture that got through this boot and kind of opened up this ball joint causing so much play. Now most front suspensions have two different types of bushings. This one here on the transverse link is a much thinner design here and it's called a handling bushing and that's just because of its transverse orientation. It takes all the cornering forces of the vehicle. We have this bushing at the rear here and that's called the ride bushing and that's more for comfort and it's there to really absorb any road shock and make everything really comfortable. You can see I can almost move it with my brother's old toothbrush here whereas this one here is pretty rigid. Oh shoot. 
So from bushings to ball joints, these are pretty much all the components that go into making the multi-link suspension system on your car work. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. Now despite being such a structural member, this aluminum subframe is actually a one-hander. 